Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. I release these videos every single Monday to keep you in the loop about all things Starship development, launch events, and more. We have one heck of an episode lined up today. From the first ever James Webb Space Telescope images, the first ever launch of the Vega C, an unexpected explosion from Starbase, and much, much more. This video was sponsored by Squarespace, the internet's premier website building tool. More on them a little bit later on. So yes, I'm sure you all know by now about the biggest bit of Starship news that we saw last week, the big booster boom. If you missed it, well, here's some footage of Booster 7 in the test stand from Lab Padre. Oof. Yes, in Elon's words, actually not good. This wasn't a static fire test by the way, but a spin prime test of the new Raptor 2 engines. A spin prime test doesn't involve ignition at all. It's basically a test that involves the spin-up of the engine's turbo pumps. Ignition, and certainly an explosion and fireball, are not expected events here. Just under 10 minutes after the initial explosion, two more smaller explosions took place, resulting in a small fire at the base of the orbital launch pad. After Elon's initial response of, yeah, actually not good, team is assessing damage tweet, he went on to state that cryogenic fuel is an added challenge, as it evaporates to create fuel air explosion risk in a partially oxygen atmosphere like Earth's, shedding some light into the cause of the big boom. He did state here that SpaceX have a lot of sensors to detect this, but obviously in this case something was missed or caught before there was any time for any response. <laughs> So, the aftermath. Well, initially, we had confirmation from Elon that the base of the booster looked okay under flashlight, and by morning, it was evident that perhaps the damage wasn't too extensive. It didn't look like the Raptor engine bells had been compromised, and aside from some superficial damage and scorch marks, stage zero seemed largely unaffected, which is a real testament to the durability of these structures. SpaceX would need to properly inspect the booster in the high bay before being able to clear it for flight, and later in the week, it was lifted out of the pad by the catch arms and rolled back to the build site. Again, there wasn't really a huge amount of damage visible in the photos during the lift. Some of the thermal protection and aero covers had been blasted off, but overall, the booster didn't look like a complete write-off. So yeah, Booster 7. First the downcomer implosion, now the spin test explosion. Hopefully SpaceX can lift the curse during Booster 7's latest stint in the high bay, and it won't end up being scrapped in favour of Booster 8. Watch this space. X. Get it? It's, uh, that was, that was terrible. Let's move on. SpaceX have made some minor amendments to their orbital flight test application with the FCC. The original plan for the flight was to launch, obviously, and then, after stage separation, the booster would perform a small boost back before making a controlled soft landing in the Gulf of Mexico, with the ship continuing to just barely shy of orbital velocity, swinging around the Earth before re-entering and splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. Now, this plan is still detailed in the FCC application, but SpaceX have now added a comment saying that while there's still a possibility that they will just splash down the booster in the Gulf, they might use the launch tower for a catch instead. Now, I think this is just SpaceX covering any and all possible outcomes, and I highly doubt that they would attempt a catch for a vehicle that has still never flown, much less demonstrated an ability to land itself, but then again, SpaceX are always doing the impossible, so who knows? What do you think? Catch or no catch? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. And hey, while you're down there, if you are enjoying the video so far, then do drop a like and a subscription. Always helps me out and I always do appreciate it. I must also give a huge kudos to all the great photographers I work with when making these Starship updates. Everyone whose work is featured in today's episode is linked in the description, so make sure you're following all of them to stay in the loop with the daily happenings at Starbase. The photographers at the build site take such amazing pictures. I guess professional cameras are just better than the ones I use on my phone. <laughs> but did you know you can play some of the best real-time RPGs and strategy games for free right now on your phone? Hmm. Anyway, this, uh, this video was sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace makes websites simple. It is super simple to use, and basically anyone who can use a web browser can use Squarespace to make a great website. But don't be put off by its simplicity. Squarespace can be used to make incredibly sophisticated websites, including e-commerce platforms for people who want to start an online storefront, photo portfolio sites for photographers and artists, or really, any website you can think of. Making a website couldn't be simpler. Just tell Squarespace what sort of website you want to make, choose from a list of professional templates, and then get customizing and create your very own corner of the internet. You can get started right now with a free trial. Just go to squarespace.com to get started, and then, when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash matlown to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Go on, click that link, you know you want to. 
Check out these photos from Greg Scott, showing the insane progress that SpaceX are making at their Cape Canaveral launch facility. It's really exciting to see this facility springing up at the pace it's going. This shot here gives us a great view of the launch tower so far, the orbital launch pad legs, and the mystery structure. Seriously, what is that? I've discussed this with other armchair Starship watchers, and the best we can come up with is that it's some sort of very overbuilt water tower. It's positioned between the Starship and Falcon 9 pads, so perhaps one reason it's so overbuilt is to protect Pad 39A from any explosions at the Starship pad, since Pad 39A is currently America's only launch pad that Crew Dragon can launch from. Or, in other words, it's the only pad that America can launch astronauts to the International Space Station from. We really can't go back to relying on Soyuz at the moment for obvious reasons. Also visible in this photo here is a Falcon 9 preparing to launch, specifically the SpaceX CRS-25 mission. This launched on the 15th of July and was the latest Cargo Dragon resupply mission to the International Space Station. The Dragon arrived at the station on schedule and autonomously docked to the forward-facing docking port of the Harmony module. This mission also carried the NASA Alana 45 mission, which consists of five educational and technology platform demonstrations. CubeSats. Another auxiliary payload was the TUM NanoSat, which is the first ever satellite from Moldova. It was created at the Technical University of Moldova and will test various technologies in space. CRS-25 wasn't the only SpaceX orbital launch last week. Yes, I can now confirm that the Starlink Group 3-1 launch was a success. I mentioned this in last week's video, but it was a little bit tricky as this launch happened mere hours before my video was published. I made the bold assumption that all had gone well, and well, I can confirm that it did indeed all go to plan. This was the first dedicated mission deploying Starlink satellites to sun-synchronous orbit. SpaceX also unbelievably pulled off a third launch last week as well. On Sunday, we saw a Starlink mission. This was the 13th launch for this particular Falcon 9 booster, and this mission marked the 50th reuse of payload fairings. The launch went very well, and the booster successfully made its 13th landing on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions. The completion of this mission represents a big milestone. Last year, SpaceX completed 31 missions in total, and with the successful completion of this Starlink launch, SpaceX have now achieved the same number of missions for 2022, and it's only July. As you can see from Rookland's latest infographic, at their current cadence they'll be likely to complete 57 launches by the end of the year. And I'm sure a minor increase in pace to bump that up to their goal of 60 is well within SpaceX's reach. Do you think they'll pull it off or just miss it? What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. On the 13th of July, we saw the first of two back-to-back -back launches from Rocket Lab. Rocket Lab recently completed the second launch pad at their Mahia site, and by having two separate launch pads, Rocket Lab is now able to eliminate the pad recycle time typically required when only launching from one single launch pad. Or, in other words, they can now launch far more frequently than they could before. This ability allows them to support the Enrol 162 and 199 missions, which carry the Razor 3 and Razor 4 national security payloads, which are designed, built, and operated by the National Reconnaissance Office in America in partnership with the Australian Department of Defense. According to Rocket Lab, this project is part of a broad range of cooperative satellite activities with Australia. The satellites will support the National Reconnaissance Office to provide critical information to government agencies and decision makers monitoring international issues. Last week's launch on Wednesday was the launch of the Razor 3 payload, and we'll see another Electron launch Razor 4 on the 22nd of July. Here's hoping that this launch is just as successful as the last. Last week, we also saw a brand new launch vehicle. It was the maiden flight of Ariane Space's Vega C rocket. Vega C, or Vega Consolidation, is an upgrade to the original Vega rocket, which will enable better launch performance and reliability. These upgrades include changing the first stage's solid fuel P80 booster for the beefier P120C booster, which is the same booster that will be used on the upcoming Ariane 6 launcher. The second stage also saw an engine upgrade, and the fourth stage has been enlarged. The third stage remains unchanged. We got lots of cool B-roll of the booster arriving at the launch site in the French Guiana. On board the rocket was the Italian Laser Relativity Satellite 2, an inert payload that doesn't actively do anything on its own, it'll just float along in orbit. It's made of a nickel alloy and contains a bunch of retro reflectors, which are used to track the satellite via ground-based laser stations, and it'll help enhance our understanding of the Earth's gravitational field and general relativity measurements. There were six other rideshare CubeSats along for the ride as well. Now, this launch was probably only supposed to have a test payload initially, but instead was loaded with satellites as a means of helping to fill the gap after the ESA lost the ability to launch Soyuz rockets due to the ongoing war in Ukraine. 
Over in China, on the 12th of July, we saw the launch of a Long March 3BE, which carried just one payload, a Tianlian-203 communication satellite. The reason why such a beefy rocket was required for just one satellite was because this satellite needed to be placed into geosynchronous Earth orbit, which of course is higher up than lower Earth orbit, thus requiring much more Delta V to reach. Now, biggest story, last week on Tuesday, we all got to bear witness to the very first spectacular images from the James Webb Space Telescope. Up until now, the telescope has been undergoing setup and testing, but these images are a sign that it's ready to begin scientific operations. The James Webb Telescope is specially tuned to see in infrared light, which is like light that's redder than red, and a longer wavelength than the human eye can detect. The reason the telescope uses infrared light is that it allows the observatory to look deeper into the universe than Hubble ever could, which was the spiritual predecessor to the James Webb, giving the telescope the ability to give us glimpses back in time more than 13 and a half billion years ago. Check out this side-by-side -side shot of the Carina Nebula. This was taken by Hubble, and this was taken by James Webb. And it should be noted that the James Webb image took far less time to take. It is stunning how much more detail James Webb can produce. If you're wondering why the brightest stars in the James Webb photos have these spikes around them, then wonder no more. These are called diffraction spikes and are produced by light interacting with the telescope's hexagonal primary mirror and the struts that support the secondary mirror. The hexagonal shape of the mirror is what produces these six bright spikes and this dimmer spike is produced by one of the struts. The other two struts that support the secondary mirror produce spikes of their own, but these spikes actually align with those created by the mirror. So so you can't really see them on photos. Now by comparison, Hubble images have four spikes around bright objects. Hubble's secondary mirror uses four struts, which corresponds to the four spikes. And now you too can tell the difference between Hubble and James Webb images, aside from the obvious resolution differences, of course. <laughs> Check out this image. This is a picture of SMACS0723. Catchy name, am I right? <laughs> SMACS0723 is a massive cluster of galaxies and is known as a gravitational lens because its sheer mass bends and magnifies the light of objects that are much further away. In this image, every place where there is a red arc-like structure, like these ones, there is a galaxy much further in the distance and much further back in time. The light in some of these arcs has taken over 13 billion years to reach the James Webb's mirror. The craziest thing though is that some of these arcs on each side of the image are actually the same object, but their light has been bent through the SMACS0723 cluster and sent it splitting on more than one path. Honestly, I could make a dedicated video on the James Webb images. They're truly breathtaking, and I've barely scratched the surface of all the amazing stuff about them. But for now, I'll leave you with this montage and a list of all these amazing people. They're my Patreon and channel members who make all of this content possible. A lot of the footage I use isn't free and costs me money to acquire licensing for, so I really couldn't do this without all of your generosity. If you want to see your name here, then you can follow the description or on-screen links, but otherwise, I'll leave things there. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.